I am the aforementioned Mr. Miller. Now, earlier this week, President Obama announced his plans for higher corporate average fuel economy or CAFE standards. Joining us to discuss this, a nice man sent me a nice book, and I've been browsing through it, and he inscribed it to me. His name's Lawrence Solomon. And he is the, or he didn't send it. Carol, that's right. Carolyn called me and told me a friend of ours sent it. I'm blanking on who. I'll have to check with her. But he liked the book so much, and he's somebody whose uh, intellect I respect. Sent the book on to me. It's called The Deniers, the world renowned scientists who stood up against global warming, hysteria, political persecution, and fraud. This is Lawrence Solomon. Larry, what's up? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Sorry about that circuitous. I had to go around the Cape of Good Hope to get to the intro, but uh, I, I, uh, I want to know about some of the men who were, who would you say, Larry, first guy in, bravest guy, who kind of took it all on his chest, because for a while here, people have been afraid to speak out against the theory that global warming is etched in stone, and uh, who, who was the first guy who turned and said, hey, enough of this crap? Well, I don't know who the first one was, but but there were a lot of them, and when they spoke out, they were they were knocked down, uh, and others saw them being knocked down, and so that had a chilling effect. Everyone started to to lie low. So even in the field of global warming, there's a chilling effect if you speak out against it. Well, maybe especially in the in the field of global <laughs> warming. I, I remember what it was like um, in the in the eighties uh, when. Uh, scientists were um, afraid to speak out about the dangers of nuclear power. One second, real quickly. 80s temperature or 80s years? 1980s. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm an environmentalist with a, a background in uh, anti-nuclear activism. And I remember how scientists were afraid to speak out in the 1980s uh, when they saw dangers in, in nuclear power. And um, there were there were a few brave souls, but they suffered suffered all kinds of recriminations, and that was one of the motivations in my writing a book about um, the scientists today who are daring to speak out um, uh, on the global warming uh, file because uh, they're suffering the same kinds of uh, recriminations that um, that the nuclear scientists did in the 1980s. Well, we're talking to author Lawrence Solomon. The book is The Deniers, and I think it's books like this that have worked up a buttress against some of these assertions by the uh, the, the environmental wax. And uh, don't you think it's turned a little, Lawrence? Don't you notice? I, I think it's changed in the last six months. It certainly has. Uh, the, in fact, the, the latest Rasmussen poll showed that only one-third of Americans um, blame human activity for uh, climate change, and that's a complete reversal from a, from a year ago. When uh, when only only one third thought that uh, that natural causes were responsible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a pretty easy shift because nobody was really paying attention. But I believe I, I want to thank Al Gore here for being such an inappropriate messenger and such an overly zealous messenger, and for overbetting the hand. I really think that he was able to turn this around and get people back to square one in a very brief time. It takes a special sort of insipid to change people's minds about this over a six-month period. But I think they looked at Gore and said, wait a second, that's Al Gore. That's not Nostradamus. That's Al Gore. And uh, I, I think that his uh, overplaying the hand has helped, don't you? Uh, yes, although he also deserves most of the credit for making this a, a huge public issue. He, he, was, he was working like a beaver back in the 80s, in fact. He was the one who brought it before the United Nations. He was the one working um, in, uh, not only uh, on, on, in before the public, but he was also working um, in, the, in the back rooms. Uh, arranging for the conferences to be held. He was the one who who arranged for the, the Rio conference of 1992 uh, to be held. Uh, he brought in thousands of environmental organizations as well as most of the uh, most most of the governments uh, in the world were represented there. That my organization was one of the ones um, that was there in, in Rio in 1992. So Al Gore almost single-handedly made this uh, a huge public issue. Yeah, I think that was a cash run, truth be told. I, I, I think that it was selfish altruism. I think that at this point, Gore had been defanged intellectually. He had been defanged as far as power goes, losing the presidential election indeed on turned on his own state, Tennessee. I think he only had one recourse, and that was to be deliberately disingenuous or to sort of self-hypnotize himself to think he believed this to this point. He's probably made $100 million out of it, and in the process, I hope the money sates him because he's, I think he screwed the cause. Well, he certainly has done uh, well financially, but 
but he, he has he has been a, a, a true believer for a, a very long time, well well before he lost uh, the, the presidency. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, unfortunately for the movement, it would appear to me, Lawrence, the only time he took eight years off from this in the last 20 years of his life is when he had the actual power to do something about it. Am, yeah. am I not correct? That's, no, that's a good point. Well, uh, listen, you're finally there. You finally have the job, and you decide you want to sidle down the hallway to overhear Clinton speaking to guys about important issues in your mind, and you take the eight years off from the environment, and the only time you really attend to it is when you need to check on the front side of it or the back side of it. Once again, I think that eats into the cause. I think people think he's an opportunist. Well, he he has he has made the most of his opportunities. Right. I shouldn't I shouldn't vent and then dump it in your lap. That's an unwieldy interview technique on my part. I'm sorry. He just exasperate me. Now, where do you think this goes from here, my friend? Now that it has turned a little, does it eventually just uh, does it winnow itself away? Do we does it dissipate to the point where we don't hear about it? What happens next? What's the next chapter? Well, we're we're going to come to some kind of a climax because there are all these uh, initiatives underway. There's uh, the, the cafe standards. There, uh, there, there are really these attempts underway to to recast um, our society into uh, a carbon economy. It's as if the entire human enterprise is going to be directed towards uh, saving CO2. So we're getting we're getting the our power industries uh, revamped. We're getting our, our transportation industries revamped. Our, our housing will have to be uh, revamped. The way the way we we are to live, if the if the carbon crowd has its way, is um, is to change uh, profoundly. And, and I think as as the public starts to realize this, there's going to be a lot of friction. Well, I would caution the president if he does sign a cap-and-trade bill or an unwieldy cafe standard, he should sign it, ironically, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a carbon uh, bill, in pencil, because it'll be erased by the electorate the next time through. I really think they've had enough of this silliness. I think they've reached the point where they realize this is a boutique notion, a narcissistic gesture in some way. There is no easier way to ascribe nobility to yourself in contemporary life than to use the simple alliterative technique, I've gone green, and I think people have had enough. If they're going to start telling them this is going to cost you $3,900 a year in cap and trade and another 1300 a year to outfit your, your Mazda in a widget, I'm call it, they're going to say enough is enough, and in 2010, that house thing is going to turn completely. All right, Larry Solomon, I appreciate the book, The Deniers, the world-renowned scientists who stood up against global warming, hysterica, political persecution, and fraud. Back with your phone calls on this subject or anything else at 866-99-DENNIS, right after this on The Dennis Miller Show. 